when we moved from Romania to the US, uh, we didn't want to leave because we owned a business that was doing quite well. We, had a, we owned a sewing factory making clothing. I don't know anything about clothing, my wife does. I was the guy calling around, selling it, doing other stuff, but we had connections. We knew the prime minister of the country, the mayor of the city, the chief of police. We had pretty good life and uh, traveling all over, involved in the church very much, doing evangelism everywhere, uh, organizing youth, starting choirs everywhere and many places. I would say 16 places that I counted in my head that we started choirs from zero and uh, building churches and I was very happy. We had quite a strong income. I'm not going to talk about that. It's not important, but um, to leave everything and come in a different country where you don't know the language. I knew about four words when we came here. Thank you, hi, bye, and no. <laughs> and yes, five words. Uh, uh, it was quite, I mean, when I came to College Dale, no offense to people in South, but they were like talking Japanese, like they were swallowing <laughs> words, saying just half of the oh, 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 oh. Oh, it was just, it was impossible to understand anything. I would go to gas station and I would just pray for the gift of tongues. It was just, <laughs> never had a computer before and I would take the first page and read one word, go the, to the dictionary, read the se second word, go to the dictionary. And I would, I could understand Dr. Blanco, Dr. Morris and Dr. Cluzet but, and Dr. Lake. That was it. I could not understand the other teachers, and they were good people, God bless them, but just I could not get it. And it would take me a whole night to read one page, checking every word in the dictionary, and I literally, literally, physically learned on my knees. I know it's hard to believe, but I learned praying over every page. And by God's grace, in three months, Dr. Morris can testify the story. In three months, I was praying in English, speaking in English. Not that I spoke well, I don't speak it well, I have an accent, I know that, but God blessed tremendously. And uh, it was a bunch of miracles that I didn't deserve and I don't deserve. Anyway, moving to the next part, something strong that I remember, and it would never leave my mind. When I was a kid, I was quite stupid and evil, I did a lot of pranks. And I will not resist. My wife told me, don't tell any pranks. I got to tell one. <laughs> in the church, I would cut a pen at the two ends and have rice in my hand. I was at the balcony at the choir. And I would watch who sleeps during the sermon. And I would shoot rice through the pen in their heads to wake them up during the sermon. <laughs> and I enjoyed it tremendously. <laughs> but... Uh, I did all type of stuff, but I would go home, and this is the point that I will never forget. And it was a long apartment, bedroom, 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 my parents' bedroom, living room, kitchen, like a train. And because I am always hungry, I can eat 10 times a day, I never gain a pound, and I'm still hungry. I know it's not fair, and I don't care anyway, that's life. <laughs> Because I was hungry, I would go at 10 p.m., 12 midnight, 2 a.m., 4 a.m., go and eat so I could sleep. And every time I would go to my parents' bedroom, my father was praying. Regardless, 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 a.m., regardless, whenever, day or night, when he was home, he was praying. And I asked him, why do you pray so much? And my father told me, I can never get enough of Christ. And I said, explain it to me. And he said, you know how much you like water and fire? I love water and fire. I just love it. A big fire pit, you know, bonfire is like heaven. And to live by a little creek and here the water is also heaven. I just love it. And to have a few dogs and cats around the house and talk to them, it's just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. And so, and have a garden. Oh, it's hard to stop not to talk about those things. I mean that. And so my father said, you know, when your mom put in the front yard, that little, it's like a plastic bath. It's like that shape. And 
she puts bubble foam and it's hot outside. It was like 115 Fahrenheit. And you get into the water and you get under and refresh and cool down and get up again. He says, how much is the water around you? I said, all over, above, under, left, right, everywhere. And my father said, well, unless you get immersed in Christ all over, you will never understand what I talk about. And he said, there is nothing safe in you unless you are immersed in Christ. I didn't fully get it. But then I started to face challenges because of Sabbath in school from the first grade because we didn't go to school on Sabbath and there was school on Sabbath. They mocked me. They, I would go home. Anyway, college, everywhere. They wanted to expel me in army. They wanted to put me in prison because of Sabbath. And every time I would talk to my dad, he would say, it's not what you do that would help you. You may plan well, you may think well, and you may be right. It's not going to save you. It's prayer. And then my father would say, don't even pray for you because God may not want you to pray for you. God may not want to save you the way you save you. Pray for God's honor because that's what he wants. It took me a while to grasp it, that when we pray for us, God cannot work. But when we give up self and pray for God's honor, then God can work. And my father would say from seven testimonies, here a day and night, and then I, he got me, he would tell me stories and stop in the middle of the story and say, I'm busy. This is the book. Finish the story. Tell me the story. Tell me the end. It's right there. Read it. He got me reading. And I read again and again, day and night. I started to wake up at 4.35 a.m. and read. Anyway, seven testimonies, page 30. To everyone who offered himself for service, not for self, withholding nothing, that's full surrender. That's not 99%. Withholding nothing. Unlimited heavenly power is given for the attainment of measureless results. Then you flip to page 33. It says all that the disciples did, every church member should do today. Can you even grasp the words? And then it says there that God is waiting for us to do that. God is waiting for the church to do that. And my father will say, if you surrender 100% and forget self, he can do more than you can dream. Just stop praying for you. And then he said something really big. He said, Whatever problems you have, God sends them and you pray to solve them, you go against God. Stop praying to solve your problems. Because nothing happens by chance. God is in control. He allowed it. And then my father would say, rather ask him, why did he allow them? It may be for your glory. It may be to save somebody. <laughs> Stop trying to solve problems. Rather, allow God to use problems for his glory. And he changed my paradigm from praying and struggling to plan and to solve to what do you want to accomplish through this. And that's a different paradigm. And that started me praying, and I learned that the more I pray, the more God can work, and the more I focus on him and forget self, the more he can work. And they, anyway, to jump to the next story, uh, Jerry told me, first time, now he changed it today. <laughs> Do not preach. We don't need another sermon. Just share a story or two from your ministry. I said, OK, because you don't let me preach, I'm going to share more stories. <laughs> And then today he said, do whatever God inspires you. But anyway, then I'm not going to preach. I'm going to jump to the next story. I put my eyes on my wife when she was three and a half and I was six, literally. And I kept my eyes on her, never had another girlfriend. We have been married for 31 years and I am handicapped without her. I cannot function. I cannot sleep well. I just, I just, it's like air. And... I would be at the tenor, she would be at the alto. The pastor would be preaching, my head was on her. I had my mouth open like when you go to the dentist. <laughs> and the other choir people would say, hey, look there, listen to the pastor. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> and I kept watching her and dreaming of her and thinking and praying. 
I know somebody may say that that's stacking. For me, it's extreme love. It's not stacking. But anyway, I kept my eyes on her and memorized her face that I could go home and close my eyes and see her. And I told her first time on Itak, I'm planning to marry you if, if you like me and if God allows it. I said, you don't even know me. I said, really, you don't know. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, and then uh, she said, I'm not planning to marry anybody except a pastor. I want to serve God. I said, I'm planning to be a pastor. Okay, deal. Let's pray about it and let's talk. We talked about three years and a half and then got married and have been married 31 years. Uh, anyway. I talked to my dad about love, and he said, you know how you need to love God? He said, how many times you dream of Dan, your wife? I said, every night. He says, before you don't dream of God every night, you don't know what love means. To fall asleep thinking of God and wake up dreaming of God and desire God so much that you forget self and you keep your eyes on him and you say, wow. And so now going into the ministry, I, I believe those two things were very important that had an effect on my spiritual walk with God. Going into the ministry, I'm going to jump over everything and get to Lexington, Kentucky. When God called us there, we did not want to move. My wife had a very good job in Wisconsin, extremely good job. And uh, recognized by the government in what she did with many, many certifications, she does an excellent job. Anyway. So we were driving to Tennessee for Thanksgiving concert in Southern and uh, driving through Nashville, Elder David Harmon, ministerial from Kentucky, then conference calls and says, are you Pavel? Yes, I am. Would you want to talk to us about, you know, moving to Kentucky? I said, no, thank you. <laughs> and I'm pretty straightforward. I politely, but why lose time? Just give them the answer, you know. No, thank you. He says, would you consider praying about it? Yes, no problem. You want to talk to us? I want you to say no, but I say, okay, let's talk. He says, would you come here if we pay your way? I said, where are you located? Nashville. I've been driving 10 hours. And when he called, I was driving through Nashville. And he says, Nashville. And I say, I am in Nashville. What are you doing in Nashville? Driving through. He says, take exit so-and-so. I see the exit. So I get on the exit. He says, take a left, take a left, take a right, take a right. Okay. Get to the conference office. And I say, I'm not interested in Kentucky. My son told me that he went in mission trip in Eastern Kentucky. And he says, people there, you really don't want to go. They have a gun when you go on their property. <laughs> and, and so I said, I'm not interested in Kentucky. And uh, anyway, long story short, God led in such a visible way that we could not oppose. We had to accept it. They will not give you the details. It will take too long. Anyway, so I got to the church. When we got to the church, the attendance was between 90 and 120 in a good Sabbath. Church broken in three groups. One small group, extreme liberal. When I say extreme, unbelievable liberal. One small group not believing in the Holy Spirit and preaching to every visitor and every young person and everybody that was sh shaking in faith that the church is fallen, the Holy Spirit doesn't exist, and all type of craziness. And one big group, extreme conservative, very conservative, and very judgmental, extreme conservative. And they were fighting each other, and many people have left the church, and people in the church divided and arguing. And first board meeting, I remember that week, Thursday, I go to the board, and my head elder says, we don't like you, pastors. That was welcome. We don't trust you. His father had been a pastor, and he left his family for a girl 21 years younger. And uh, basically, he just lost trust in pastors. He said, we don't trust you. We don't. What do you want? You come here. As soon as you get a better call, you leave, and you don't care for us. And you pastors, this is what you do. You try to impose your plans and to manipulate. And if we don't do your way, you get angry, and then you start working politics around. And he went, oh, no, 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 no. And I go, I kept quiet. It doesn't make sense to argue or to convince. You know, it's, you cannot convince somebody that made up their, their mind. You just can pray for them. And you can love them. And so I went home and I told my wife, 
And she says, well, it means this is God's place for you. <laughs> and she says, God sent you here for that man. You cannot move before you save that man. And I said, well, let's pray for him. Long story short, uh, yes, another one. A, a lady in the church comes to me and says, we don't like Romanians. It was a good welcome. It was unbelievable. It felt me feel so good. It made me just enjoy it and rejoice in it. And I'm a little sarcastic, you know. I think you, <laughs> you can feel it. Anyway, so another one. I said in the board, what do you do for outreach? And the treasurer said, we don't believe in evangelism. It just doesn't work. So everything was upside down. It doesn't make sense to argue. It doesn't make sense to convince. It doesn't make sense to fight. Regardless who wins, everybody's going to lose. The single way to change it is to pray it. So I declared war in prayer. I went home, and my wife and I prayed for three months every morning from five to seven. Meanwhile, I just kept listening and praying with them. Did not try to change anything. It doesn't make sense. You can make plans, another plan, and then nothing will happen, and just lose time. And I remember what my father said, the way you improve, the way you win is prayer. So we prayed from five to seven for three months, and nothing happened. And many times God doesn't answer, not because he doesn't answer, but because answer to prayer, most of the time, is not an event, but a process. It takes time to God to work not only with you. He may have a plan that you don't even think about. It makes time to God, it makes it takes time for God to prepare you for the plan. If he would say, build an ark, would you build it unless you had a, co a connection with God to know his voice? It takes time to prepare your mind to do whatever he says. It takes time for you to prepare the other people that you work with. It just, it doesn't happen over a second. It's a process. So my father would say, do not stop praying. Don't make prayer an event in a crisis. Make prayer the breath of the soul, a style, a way of life. And so my wife and I did not give up prayer. After three months, we said, you know what? We increased prayer. If God didn't answer, that means we need more prayer. So we added one night a week, Monday night. We would pray from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. the whole night without sleep. And started to pray even more for the church. My wife started to fast. She would fast. She can fast up to 10 days. The most I can fast is two hours. But... <laughs> <laughs> But, <laughs> but I, I would fast from other things. I, I could fast, you know, from uh, watching news, and that's all I watch, you know. And I know it's not good. I agree with you. And it's garbage. It's all bad. But uh, I stopped watching news. I stopped listening to mu music. I listen only, that's the way I was raised, classical music and hymnals. Anything else, I, it doesn't go good with me. But anyway, I know it may be extreme, but just, that's the way I was raised. And so... We started to pray a whole night. And then I said, Lord, I would like you to change me and help me be like Jesus to the point that I can reach their hearts. And they would see it and they would turn around and be revived. And as they get revived, you could give us the plan you have for this community, not only for the church, because I'm not the pastor of the church. I am the pastor of the community. And I would like you to change me and the church to the point that we can reach the community. Well, they told me, you cannot reach this community. Lexington is very affluent. Half of them are millionaires. The other half are Baptists. They have been saved already. There is no way nobody will come. We had evangelism. We spent money. So-and-so came, big names, and nobody came. One time we had the Baptist. They left next Sabbath. They never came back. The conference told me 72 years with one to two baptisms a year. No growth. Zero. It doesn't work here. And so I prayed for God's plan. I could not go to them and say, oh, let's do this or that. Moreover, if it doesn't work, you know, you lose credit. Well, one night at camp meeting, I like camp meeting, we get together. I don't like camp meeting when you pitch old tents. Dust, spiders, I cannot stand that, but anyway. <laughs> I smile like everybody else and kept pitching tents. I'm praying for God's plan for Lexington. And it was Monday night. I prayed the whole night. 
and somehow I fell asleep by the bed in my, on my knees praying. I was tired from tense, you know. And uh, God woke me up around 2, 2 15 a.m. with a bunch of thoughts. This is what you do in Lexington. And my father told me a big word. He said, whatever you remember, you forget. Whatever you write down, you remember. You need to journal. You need to write down everything. And so as soon as God gave me those thoughts, I got up, wrote down four pages in detail. This is what you do. First, second, third, third. details. Picky details. And after that, I said, Lord, I'm not going to do it. I need confirmation. If I ate too much last night and it's just my mind, I need you to tell me that you told me. And I prayed from about 4 a.m. until 7 a.m. For, for confirmation. At 7 a.m. is breakfast. Breakfast, Sabbath, family, those are holy things, you know, and you don't miss a meal. And I said, Lord, I got to go to eat, and then I continue praying. As I said, amen, Dr. Schmidt, Ed Schmidt from Andrews called and said, Pavel, you asked me to come to Lexington. Yes, I want you to talk about evangelism. He says, no, I got a Sabbath available. I'm going to talk about something different, a pilot project. I said, okay, what are you going to talk about? He told me exactly what I had on those papers. And I was speechless. He says, are you there? I said, yes. And I said, wow. And I mean it. And he says, what? What's wrong? And I told him that I've been praying for four months by now. And he says, I'm coming. God is going to do great things. I go to my board and I tell them the whole story but God's answer. I've been praying and then my wife and then the whole night and then God gave me and then Edge Meat called and, okay, what did God say? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> and they, please tell us. Nope. You will not do it. You told me evangelism doesn't work. I'm not going to tell you. They please tell us, no, call the conference, get a different pastor. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I said, this is the deal. You go home. We have no board meeting. You pray for a month. So God will tell you what he told me, and then we do it. The treasurer says, we never missed a board in this church. <laughs> Say, well, we'll do it. We'll do it this time. So well, we got to fix the parking. I said, no, you don't have to fix the parking. You have been fixing the parking for 100 years. You got to pray. And I said, unless we pray, I should not be here. You don't need me. This is the way we'll do it. We'll do it by prayer. And so you go home, and next board meeting, if you didn't pray, you go home again. And you can call the conference, look for somebody else. This is the way we'll go. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You will pray, and God will tell you what to do, and we'll do it together. They went home. And then I, you don't follow up, it's not going to happen. People are good people, but busy. So I called them starting Sunday, every day, every board member, and I prayed with them. Next month, two of the board, my head elder and the Bible study coordinator. By the way, they had only two Bible studies going on. My, my Bible study coordinator, they said, this is strange. This is what God told us. It was the same thing. And then I shared with them. And we started to do it. And it was not evangelism the way we know evangelism. It's a whole one-year process that starts again, and it's a way of life, the whole church doing it. And basically, we started with in-home Bible studies because people don't come to church, but they feel comfortable at home. And in a community where they told me nobody wants the Bible, when we sent, in Lexington, there are 10 zip codes, and we don't bite more than we can chew. So we send invitations to one zip code a year. It's a 10-year plan. And then we go in homes to those people and study with them at home. And the rule is that we do not teach. People don't like to be told what to do. People like to discover and the Holy Spirit to impress, not me to impress. And so we go home, and the rule was not teach. If you teach, you are disqualified. That's easy. Anybody can do it. So we said, you knock in the door. Hey, this is your request. This is study number one. Bye. Oh, hold on a second. Nah, I'm busy. Bye. People opened the door like that, you know, a chain. Eh? Bye. They knew that we are not about to sell or change anybody. We just offered a free Bible study and left. I told them, Edge Meat actually told them, the goal is not to teach. The goal is to build relationships and friendship and trust. And pray with them and love them. So, Next week, this is study number two. Next week, 
they opened the door. First week, it was like, you know, open the door, and you say, can I pray? We, we believe in prayer. Can I pray with you? And you pray with them. Third time, knock in the door. Hey, I have a little time available. Can I come in and study? And soon, some didn't let us in because the house was messy. We tell them, hey, my house is like after Hiroshima. You know, it's just a mess. <laughs> don't worry, I don't come to inspect. Don't worry, you know. And if they say no, you come over. We study in my house. If they say no, I'm going to take you out to eat together and study. Don't give up. You need to build friendship. And so <clears throat> we discovered that those that we got to visit with and eat with, 72% got baptized, and those that we didn't, 0.05% got baptized. Basically nobody. I mean, we had one from about 700 Bible studies. Yeah. Anyway, 0.000 whatever, you know. So people were very skeptical, but it was easy. You don't teach. Mailmen. They don't convince you to open the mail. They deliver the mail. You don't give them only written. You give them a DVD. People can argue with people. Nobody argues with the TV. They watch it. There is no way to argue, you know. <clears throat> and so we gave them Bible studies. Quick, going, not going through the details. After three months of Bible studies, we offered them seminars. We gave them a survey. And then whatever you need, family, financial, addiction, whatever, a bunch of, about eight to ten seminars. And then we invited them to church on a Thursday or a Sunday and had a small group of people. We did not ask the church to come. If you ask them to come, they don't come. We ask them not to come. Please stay home. We beg you, don't come. We don't want many. That would scare the visitors. We just want about five of you. They came. If you tell them not to come, they come. <laughs> anyway, and... We prepared the meal and told them, do not teach. Resist the temptation to talk about Sabbath. Just pray for people. Just use any opportunity. What can I pray for you? And pray for them. Don't pray that they repent. Pray for whatever they ask. Just build friendship. Anyway, we offer them seminars, build friendship. After another three months, we reached the community. We went to the city hall. And we asked what they need. And we started to feed the homeless every Saturday night, clean the parks every Sunday. We invited the police force and the fire department over to the church. Did not give a sermon. We gave them a meal and a prayer of blessing and protection and thankfulness. We went to the police stations, all 25, and the fire stations, I don't remember how many. And for those that were unable to come to our meal, we went and gave them cookies and juice and uh, cards, thank you cards, and prayer. And you know what they said? They said, you know, nobody ever came to pray for us. And then the newspapers, they learned about it, and we were all over, you know. And then just, it's a lot of activities that we did in the city that made the church known. So when you do evangelism, the other pastors will not say, oh, don't go there. Because everybody knows that that church cares for the community, you know. So we reached the community in the sixth month, in the ninth month, we started evangelism, and now we invited everybody. Now, let me give you a story so I tell you how it happened. We had many stories, and I mean many, many stories. I'm going to give you one. Dr. Morris knows the story, but I don't believe the others do. When we asked people to go and teach, oh, I'm afraid to teach. I'm afraid to give a Bible study. We had a few go. People that left the church learned that something is happening, and they started to come back. I was preaching. We made a deal. Nobody should enter our church without being prayed for. Nobody. You watch, nobody should enter or leave without being prayed for. It should be a church of praying, a prayer church. And so a lady came late. She had blue, pink, crazy hair. She had rings all over. I mean all over. She had chains. She came late, and she left early. When we were singing the closing song, she left. Now, nobody prayed for her, because the saints were singing. And so I said, nobody leaves our church without being prayed for. So I left the saints singing, and I walk. They thought I go to the bathroom, you know, I could not hold it. I was not going to the bathroom. I run after her. She sees me. She runs to the car. She does to, tries to open the door. 
I stopped the door. I want to go home. I said, calm down. You'll go home. Uh, uh, I don't want to talk. I said, that's okay. I'll do the talking. <laughs> I said, tell me your name. Uh, okay. She told me her name. I'm not going to say her name. I didn't ask her permission to tell the story. But anyway, I told her my name. I know. I Googled you. People can Google you, you know. I Googled you. Okay. And then uh, she says, wait, tell me even saying anything. I don't believe in God. I said, what are you doing here? This is not a, it's not a theater. This is a church. I know. What are you doing here? Uh, uh, I don't know. I heard something good was happening. But you preached about prayer. I don't believe in prayer. God doesn't answer prayers. I said, I know. God doesn't like Americans. He answers only Romanian prayers. She looks to me and she says, you crazy. God answers every prayer in my mind. <laughs> I got you. I said, okay, you said God doesn't answer prayers, and now you said God answers every prayer. Make up your mind. She says, uh, he didn't answer my prayer. I said, you have blue eyes? Only, you know, this type of eyes get an answer, you know. She said, what are you talking about? And I say, what have you been praying for? I cannot tell you. Okay, can I pray for you? Oh, it doesn't make a difference. Okay, so well, I want to tell you that God answers my prayers and that God wants to change your life and he is able to change your life and he will change your life today if you allow him to. Who do you think you are? Are you a prophet? Are you God to tell me that he will change me? He said, no, I'm not, but I know my God. I know how much he loves you and I know that he can change you, no doubt. What should I do? I've been in drugs for 15 years. I went to rehab. I went in jail. I tried. I prayed. I cannot give up every two hours. I have to do drugs. Otherwise, I start shaking. I cannot help. I said, well, do you want to give up drugs? Yes. OK, today is your day. Starting today, God will start working on you. Don't tell me to pray. Nah, I'm going to tell you what to do. Stop praying about victory on drugs. What? said, you focus too much on drugs and on you. You are not important. She was like, what are you talking about? I said, you, drugs, your problem is not important. Me, not important. God is important. Stop focusing on drugs. From now on, focus on God and his ministry. Go and give a Bible. Save somebody else. If you are lost, not important. She looks to me. I want to be saved. I said, just stop trying to save self. Save somebody. Go and give a Bible study. When you work with people, you will change. You will give up drugs. She was like, I cannot give a Bible study. I cannot teach. I said, I know. I'm not asking you to teach. I'm just asking you to deliver. And I told her what, how to do it. And she says, God strongly put in my mind not to talk to her about prayer or drugs. Before I talk, I asked God to tell me what to say. And God put in my mind, don't talk about prayer or drugs or victory. Just ask her to work. So I said, you need to give a Bible study. I cannot. I said, yes, you can. This is how you do it. If I give a Bible study, you say I'll give up drugs? Yes. If I don't give up drugs, I will never come back to church, never talk to you again, never pray again. I said, deal. Okay, give me the Bible study. This is the Bible study. This is the address. I will pray for you. She goes. She calls back in 15 minutes. I hate you. I hate your church. I hate your God. I said, just tell me what happened. She says, it's an apartment building, doors are locked, you ring a bell, and somebody would bust the door open from inside. And nobody is home. God doesn't consider me worthy to give a Bible study. I said, did you pray that God would open the door? No. Go in the car and pray. Ah, okay. Didn't think about it. She called me two minutes later. I prayed. God didn't open the door. I don't want to talk to you again. I said, how much did you pray? Uh... I don't know. I said, two minutes. You just called me two seconds ago. Now you call me again. How long should I pray? Until the door opens. <laughs> and she says, she says, five minutes? I said, until the door opens. And she says, half an hour? I said, you don't know English. Until the door opens. I cannot do that. I have a family. I have kids. I have a job. I said, do you want to give up drugs? Yes. Then stop arguing. Get busy praying. She says, but... How long? 
I said, until the door opens. You pray in the car, you don't go home, you don't go to sleep, you don't go to work tomorrow, you get retired, you die in the car praying, and you say, Lord, I'm not going to move before the door opens. And then I said, this is the covenant that I make with you. As long as you stay in the car, I don't go home, I don't eat, I don't sleep, I'm going to pray in my office until the door opens. We together will pray. Okay. That was around 2.30. She called me at 5 p.m. Pastor, you will not believe what happened. I said, tell me the story. Let me decide. She says, I prayed for about 15 minutes, and the door didn't open, so I got angry. I stopped praying, and I start, opened my eyes and started to argue with God. Why don't you open the door? I need to give a Bible study. I need to change. I said, lady, you just started to pray. I said, what do you mean? You said you prayed for 15 minutes, and then you started to argue. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. God doesn't need you to be fake. God wants you to be honest. He can handle your situation. And I said, when you started to open your heart is when you started to pray. So I said, now tell me what happened next. Well, when I opened my eyes, I said, please let me do a Bible study. The door opened. And she said, somebody was taking the trash to the trash container. So I stopped praying. And I run to him and say, I have a Bible study. I need to go to apartment number 14. They are not home. Let me go and get it under the door. The guy says, no, if they are not home, I cannot let you in. But I am upset with you. And she says, with me? You don't even know me. And the guy says, I asked for a Bible study and nobody came. (laughs) And she says, no problem. I can give you a Bible study. Go back to the pastor. Get another one. Come tomorrow and give it to apartment 14. He says, okay, come in. I said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not supposed to come in. I'm supposed to deliver and say bye. (laughs) The guy says, no, I really, I know nothing about God. I need you to come in and help me. And she says, he took me by hand. And for some reason, I got in. And she says, he's a tall guy, long hair, leather jacket, motorcycle guy. And she said, he left me alone in his apartment and he left. And she says, wow, why would he leave? He said, sit down, and then he left. She started to pray for protection. And she says, I was was tempted to leave, but somehow I felt that I should stay. He came back with 11 other guys, all tall, leather jacket, long hair. And he says, folks, we have been praying and asking that God would give us victory over drugs. I've been praying that prayer. God sent us an angel. Sit down and listen to her. And she started to cry, and she said, I'm not an angel. I've been in drugs for 15 years. And the pastor told me that if I give a Bible study and stop focusing on self, God will give me victory. So I guess you need to give a Bible study. (laughs) (laughs) And she says, I'm unable to teach. This is the DVD. This is the study guide. Let's watch it together. And she says, Pastor, when the DVD was over, those 12 guys and me, Everybody, we were all crying. And they begged me, please come back. And then she said, it is 5 p.m. I came to church around 11 a.m. Between 11 and 5, I didn't do drugs, and I did not feel any need. I said, lady, when you focus on Christ, he works on you. Stop focusing on self. There is nothing safe. You'll get either proud or discouraged. Keep your eyes upon Jesus at any moment. She kept coming since and giving Bible studies. I told her because sharing is more important than preaching. Next Sabbath, you share the story. Me, in front of the church? Never. I said, I'll do the talking. You just do this and that, okay? (laughs) Okay. We had an interview. After she did the, uh uh-huh, uh-uh. Have you ever given a Bible? Uh-uh. Did you want to give a Bible study? No. And then I basically told the story with her help. I said, how many of you want real change? The whole church up. We received 276 requests for Bible studies, and we had 56 members involved in giving Bible studies. And many stories. I cannot, I'm not going to go through them. Many stories. And then we moved to the second stage, to the third. I got them praying. The whole church started, the whole board, and then the whole church started to pray. 
And then we started to meet at my house, have food, a big fire, eat together, share, sing, pray, and then brainstorm. Quick, one more story, and that's it. I don't know how long do I have. Another one, two minutes? That, that's it. That's the one. And so, so, no, I need to stay in time because, you know. So, what, what was next? I had people over to my house four times a year, the board, and many times a year, the youth, and many times a year, the whole church. Just about two, three weeks ago, we had the whole church come. 172 cars. I mean that. Counting. I count. I count people. I count cars. I count everything, you know. Even when I drive, I count around. And, anyway. <laughs> and so 172 cars came. We all prayed and shared. It was just amazing. It's a family. And the whole church involved in evangelism and the whole church exploding and united. We had first year nine baptisms, second year 16. I could go on. Last year, we, in one year, 52 people baptized in an Anglo church. We talk about a well-to-do church, rich church. We talk about 16 physicians, all rich people. 52 baptisms, one out of 52 left. All the others, 51, are in the church giving Bible studies, working. And just, it, there is no conflict. You can call anybody. I don't even care who you call. Zero, literally. I am not aware of any conflict in the church. Unity, prayer, love, work. We have out of 300 people attending, we have, I would say, roughly 250 to 260 working. I could give you the jobs. You give me the name. I, it's in that group, does that. It's in that group. Basically, I could not face it anymore. It was too much to organize. And I had my elders pick up one department each, and they just report what to pray for or the good stories. And the elders watch the departments, and I just pray with the elders. And it's just it's exploding. We have no more room in the church, no more room in the parking. Two Sabbaths ago, we started two services because of lack of place, you know. And uh, people keep flow. People that left church years ago, they come back. Visitors, every Sabbath is crazy. Anyway, so we had people to our home for brainstorming, for visioning. We prayed, and that was in the beginning, right after the story that I told you, the Bible studies. And so I told them, pray for God's vision for this church. I am not going to give you my vision. I don't want you to have my vision, and I don't need your vision. We need to pray, both of us, you and me, for God's vision. So I asked them to pray, to write down three important things. They left, came back, and gave me a paper with three important things. I looked a little to the papers. We should start church in time and finish in time. I took their papers, and I said, you know that I love you? Yes. Okay. You will not be upset for what I do next. No. Good. I threw the papers in the fire. <laughs> And I said, I want you to go in the forest, 50 acres, and pray and not come back before God tells you the vision. And if he doesn't tell you, go and pray again. And humble yourself before the Lord and plead with the Lord and say, I'm not going to go before you give me the vision. And I said, you don't come back here. You go home if he doesn't give you a vision. You don't come back here before you have an answer for prayer. They left one hour, one hour and a half. They started to come back, heads down, quiet. I said, now I want you to write down God's vision. I forgot to mention, I told them, if it's small, it's you. Because usually we pray for things that we can do. And then we do it and say, God did it. And we keep our eyes on things instead of keeping our eyes on God and know how big he is and pray for big things and expect big things and trust in him and seek his vision. And if he gives us the vision, he will do it. And so I said, I want you to pray for God's vision. If it's small, pray again, because God is not small. Well, they came back. Whew. And they said, we want to have our own radio tower. We want to have television here in Lexington. We want to do evangelism 24-7, 12 months a year. We want to do canvassing every year at least four times. We want to do Bible studies. We want to do this. We want to do that. We want to... They went on and on and on. How many seminars a year? How many? I said, what's wrong with you? We don't have the people. We don't have the money. It's too much. And they say to me, didn't you say that it, it's God's vision? is big and that he will provide? I said, yes, I did. 
But let's pick only three things. I was unfaithful. And I picked up three things that I knew that we could do because I didn't want them discouraged. And they got kind of upset with me. Good for them. And they left not very happy. That night, I didn't have a lot of peace. Anyway, next morning, I flew to Carolina, Billy Graham's place. We had a meeting, prayer conference. Ruthie asked me to speak there, Ruthie Jacobson. I spoke there. After I spoke, I go to my hotel room. I never in my life lost a key, broke a telephone. I don't know how my wife keeps losing keys and breaking phones all the time. I just don't get it. I never lose anything. I know where I put them. If it's dark, I can go straight, pick them up. And when people move them, I am not happy about it. But anyway. <laughs> and so I put my telephone on the desk my water cup on the desk, open my laptop to check my email, hit the water cup, it spills over the telephone, it burns the telephone. I opened it, took the battery out, put it in rice, used the hair dryer, I prayed, no resurrection. <laughs> the telephone would not even turn on. So I prayed again, I had faith, nothing. I went to Ruti, Ruti, I cannot go to sleep before I call my wife. Can I use your phone? Sure. I call. And then I says, hello, Ruthie. I said, no, nah, it's me, not Ruthie. Why do you call on Ruthie's phone? Uh, I destroyed my phone. What? What did you do? This is what I did. Oh, I am so glad. Now you'll stop <laughs> saying that I keep breaking phones. Now you broke one, so you'll keep quiet. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's just. I just called to say good night and I love you. We talked. I give Ruthie the phone. I go to my room. And I want to pray. And I am unable to pray. And I said, Lord, I really want to connect with you. Please, I want to be with you. Unable to pray. And as I keep praying, God says, you went against me. I said, how? You asked them to pray for God's vision. I gave them the vision, and you stopped them. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. If you fix my mistake, I'll confess in front of the church. But please fix it. As soon as I prayed that prayer, I got peace, I could pray. When I finished prayer, my dead phone started to ring. I mean that. And it was the conference. And they say, everything that I said no came within half an hour on a dead phone. Everything that I said no. The conference called, we have a project, we want to send the academy kids to a church to do canvassing every year for so many years on our expense. Would you let the kids do canvas in your church. Yes, thank you. Hang up the phone. I say, hey, the phone is working. I can call Dana. I look at the phone, and the phone is not even on. And I try to start it, and it doesn't turn on. It's dead. And it starts ringing. A lady says, I am the director of the local cable TV over Lexington. And I am trying to put a few hours of spiritual teachings on the TV. And I don't like what I get. And I went online and heard some of your prayer seminars. And I think Lexington needs it. I'm going to offer you three to five hours a week for free. And she said it's seven to $12,000 one hour. Depends on the timing of the day. I'm offering you three to five hours free if you would give me your presentations. <laughs> Duh. Sure, I'll give them to you. Thank you. I hang up the phone. I get a phone call from a guy who says, I'm not a member of your church. I'm 40 miles away in a small church, only uh, just a small group of people. God put in my heart to build a radio tower. I am offering you a radio tower for free, the location for free, everything is if you are willing to start and to put the rest of the expenses. Everything that I said no to my board came within half an hour on a dead phone. I went back to my church and I said, listen, I got to confess. When I asked you to pray for big things and I stopped you, it was me not having faith. And I'm so sorry. And this is what God did. Oh, I thought they would hate me. They loved me even more. You never got to be, be honest. You never got to be human. You know? They loved me. They said, let's do it. We started many stories. I'm going to give just the radio story. We sent an, an application to FCC for a radio tower. There were four frequencies in Lexington. 
and 16 institutions competing for the four. It's a point scale. The more points you have, the more chances you have to be accepted. We were rejected because all the others had more points than we did. We had two points. Everybody else had five or more points. And my church got so discouraged. Oh, you're rejected. We thought it was God's vision. It was. When in the Bible do you see anything that God asked them to do and Satan didn't attack? When God wants you to do something, you should face challenges if it's from God. But then you pray. And they said, oh, no, it's the law, it's the FCC, it's the government. Nothing is going to happen. So I kept praying. We got a letter from the government to withdraw our application, to take it back. And the board, let's take it back. I said, no, leave it there. Pastor, you don't know to take no for an answer. I said, yes, because God said so. Now take it back. No, leave the application there. We argued back and forth. Eventually, they loved me so much that they accepted what I said. <laughs> that was June. I kept praying. I have to say, they got discouraged after a few months of prayer. Most of them gave up. Only two of them, David Parker and Peter, they both are doctors. They kept praying with me. We prayed December 15. We got a letter from the government. And it says, our machines failed. There were five frequencies, but our machines didn't see the fifth. And because all the others withdrew their applications, Yours is the single one left over. So by default, this fifth frequency, it's yours. <laughs> I told the church, everybody was like graduation day, jumping up and down, screaming. See, I said, calm down, calm down. And then I said, we need about $27,000 besides what we got donations. Next Sabbath, we had 54700 <laughs> in one week. And uh, we are on the air, on the air 24-7, preaching the gospel and... Bible study requests and just explosion. People are extremely happy. People that left church and came back, they share before the church and they say, we just cannot help. We want to be in the church 24-7. They come every day. They come Monday. They start. Ernie came. He left church 20 years before. I found him Monday painting the church. Ernie, what are you doing here? I just cannot help. I want to be here. People love it. You cannot even stop them. So, I'm going to close and say this. Whatever plans we do, they are good. We should plan. We should be organized. We should brainstorm. But prayer should be before, after, and during. And unless we humble ourselves and totally immerse in prayer, nothing will happen. Just another plan. Because it's not what we do. We know this. It's only the Holy Spirit. 